was so glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Oh. When the believers collectively come together, God comes together with us. And he's in us and upon us. But where's, where there's the power of the one, there's the power of the two. Where there's the power of the two, there's the power of the three. Where there's the power of the three, there's the power of the four. And multiplied, multiplied, multiplied power is among us when we get together and we believe God for intervention, for divine intervention. Tonight, I want to encourage you. The word of God will not return void. It will accomplish the thing for which it has been sent. The word of God is the most powerful weapon that we have in our lives against the enemy, against the circumstance, against the heartache, against the pain. It is the word of God that has power to save, to heal, to deliver, to set us free, to change the circumstances. You don't like your circumstances? Check your mouth. What are you saying? Check your, check your mind. What are you thinking, saints? Now, I am not holier than thou up here. We all have bad moments. <laughs> But you want to get that sweet victory? What are you saying? The word of God will not return void. You get your beautiful holy Bible out. You open it. The Bible says that the word of God has a voice. It talks to us. The Bible says that the Lord God himself had a plan from the very beginning to send his son into the earth. And when he sent his son and he poured out his blood upon the mercy seat for you and I, and he said, it is finished, it is done. He sent us the Holy Spirit to be our comforter, our teacher, our guide, our helper, our advocate, our attorney. Everything we would ever need is with us. So line yourselves up. I'm going to line myself up. Thank you. I heard the word of the Lord come out, and I'm like, yes, sir. The Lord rules in majesty and might. He, def he has definitive power that he precisely uses to deliver his people. He has a definitive power and a definitive plan to precisely deliver you and me. Don't give up. Don't give up. You run to the Father. Run to the Father. Run to the Word. Hurl the Word out of your mouth. Put it in your mind. Put it in your thoughts. Put it, put it in, your, in your coat jacket. Put it in your car. Put it on your mirror. You say the Word of God and you say, the Word of God is true for me. I will not always be like this. My story is subject to change because I have a good father that has a good plan. The acceptable, perfect, and good plan is coming into my life. Not the, well, that's not really what I wanted plan. No. Acceptable, good, and perfect will. He loves us. He loves us, believers. Hide yourself in the word. Get in there. Get, get in there and say, Holy Spirit, talk to me. Oh, I promise you, he will talk to you in the word of God. It's rich. It's rich. So I want to encourage you tonight. We're in the middle of the week, and we're with one another. Amen. And we are overcomers. Amen. Amen. That's good stuff, Cherie. I sure love you. Oh, I love you too. <laughs> <laughs> Do I get my kiss? All right. Amen. Come on now. Give a good hand clap. Praise the Lord. You say, why do you do that, Pastor Kim? I do that because I believe that today God's people need to see a husband and wife that have been married for 39 and a half years and are still head over heels in love with one and other. Can I have a good amen? Praise the Lord. Give Dave a good hand clap. Thank you, Dave. Thank you. Well, tonight we're going to talk about do not be deceived. And so we're going to start out here in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 4, and look at 
what Jesus said to take heed that no man or no one deceives us. So Matthew chapter 24, beginning at verse 1. Then Jesus went out and departed from the temple, and his disciples came up to show him the buildings of the temple. And Jesus said to them, Do you not see all these things? Assuredly, I say to you, not one stone shall be left here upon another that shall not be thrown down. Now as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately. Everyone say they came to him. They came to him. Say privately. privately. Now, it's important to understand that in the original language, the word came is the Greek word prosekahomrihi, and it means to draw near with one's heart, to bow down, to reverence, to hunger, and to thirst for and to worship. You see, the disciples' relational hunger and thirst and surrendered heart towards Christ far exceeded any desire to have their questions answered. And so when they came to him privately, I mean, they were just so flat out head over heels in love with Jesus, they immediately began to bow down, they immediately began to cry out, they immediately began to praise, they immediately began to worship Jesus, their master, their savior, their redeemer, their healer, their soon coming king. Come on now, someone help me preach a little bit tonight, amen? This is so cool when you look at it in the reality of the God-breathed, Holy Spirit-breathed, inerrant Word of God that has been written down for eternity for you and I to live by because we're to live by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And so many Americans and even some of us in the body of Christ live from paycheck to paycheck instead of living by every word that comes out of the mouth of God. And I know the temptation to live from paycheck to paycheck. And I know what it's like to have more bills at the end of the month than you have money in the bank. But you see, there's a way you can turn that and yank that around and put your foot of authority down and decide, I'm going in the master's presence. I'm going to forget about the circumstances that I'm facing, and I'm going to bow down before Jesus Christ, and I'm going to take a drink of his life, a drink of his spirit, a drink of his wisdom. Come on now, a drink of his revelation, a drink of his purpose for my life. I I refuse to live a purposeless, purposeless life. What about you? Amen. Amen. Well, there's at least one of us out there that are refusing to live a purposeless life. But you see, this is so possible. Now, let's keep looking at this here. <clears throat> now, as he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately saying, tell us, and they asked three questions, tell us, when will these things be, and what will be the sign of your coming, number two, and of the end of the age? Now, I want you to look very closely at the first thing Jesus said, because he did not go off in a different direction. He was answering their questions. And he said this, Jesus answered and said to them, take heed that no one deceives you. That's so important to realize. Everyone say, take heed that no one deceives me. Because you see, at the end of the age, deception is going to be the most prevalent enemy that you and I will face. So, number two, many will come in Christ's name as preachers, and will deceive many. Look at Matthew 24, 5. For many will come in my name. You have to realize that he didn't say many will come and pretend they're the Messiah and that, that they are me returning again. No, he says many will come in my name. The only ones that come in his name 
are preachers and believers. And so this is going to be preachers coming in his name. And notice he used the word many, which means a multitude. There's going to be a multitude, not a few individuals, but a multitude of people coming in his name saying, I am Christ, which is the Greek word Christos. Christos means to be called of God, to smeared or rubbed with oil, to consecrate to an office of ministry, and to say that I'm a highly anointed man or woman of God. And there's so many today. All you've got to do is go to social media and they're everywhere saying, I've got a new revelation. I've had a dream. I've had this. I've had that. I'm a highly anointed man or woman of God. And they will deceive many. The Greek word deceived, which is plenio in the Greek language, means to wander from the place of safety or truth or virtue and to go astray. And that's the enemy's plan to pull you and I out of the safety of the local church where God has planted us in a church family with a good, godly pastor who loves Jesus, loves our families, and watches over our souls as one that must give an account to God. Amen? Amen. You see, these internet gurus, social media gurus, we don't know whether or not they're planted in a local church. We don't know if they have a real pastor or not. We have no idea. They have no desire to know you and don't care whether you know them. There's no relationship there. And you see, it's the false gospel and the false fivefold ministry standing in that position of authority when they've been given no authority. It's like individuals that are a part of a local church and they just get a whim and they decide, I'm going to raise myself up and I'm going to go out instead of waiting to be sent out by godly leaders. I remember when Cherie and I were in the internship pastor's training program at Victory Christian Center. And I can remember when Billy Joe, Pastor Billy Joe, uh, called Cherie and I forward. And he laid hands on us, and he also laid hands on others. And he says, it's time for you to go. I'm sending you out. Go and do what God has called you to do. But man, I'm telling you, there was a waiting time. And uh, sometimes, you know, you can get impatient and you can decide, well, I'm going to have me an Ishmael. You know, I'm just going to decide to do such and such. And uh, you lose your place of safety when you do that. The enemy comes to thrash. He doesn't come to help. You know, many of us, when we're called into a ministry, we have a desire. We know what God has called us to do. But I'm telling you, that waiting time is no fun. No fun to go through that waiting time. And you wait, and you wait, and you wait. And I can remember when the Lord spoke clearly to me all the way back when I was in my late teen years, early 20s. I knew exactly what God had called me to do. I knew his exact assignment for my life. I had no clue how a lot of these things were going to happen. Because, you know, whether you're a preacher or whether you're a parishioner, I suppose that's kind of a bad terminology to use, but it's the only thing that comes to me right now. Usually when God leads us and guides us and is directing us to do something, Sometimes he tells us to do things where we don't have a dime. We have no clue where it's going to come from. I remember when Pastor Billy Joe laid hands on us and sent us out. We didn't know where in the world the money's going to come from for us to accomplish the things that God has told us to do. Even today, as I'm serving here as associate pastor and having the time of my life one of the things I love doing the most, this may shock you because you say, well, how can that be true, Pastor Kim? How can that be true? I mean, you, you, you've been in ministry for nearly 40 years, full-time ministry. And, uh, but yeah, one of the things I love doing the most is greeting every one of you 
on Sunday morning and training other people to greet everyone with the same enthusiasm, to roll the red carpet out to everyone. You see, because you never know who's going to come through that door. And you never know what a person has gone through or not gone through during the week. Whether they're rich, whether they're poor, whether they're black, whether they're white, whether they're Hispanic, whether they have a lot of edumacation or no edumacation. People are people, and we all go through the same battles, the same trials, the same difficulties. Well, well why is greeting so important? Because when we greet people, like the scripture says, in that culture they greeted one another with a holy kiss. In other words, it was like the arms of compassion of Jesus putting those arms of the Lord around individuals, not knowing what they've gone through, but loving on them, caring for them. And, and so it's an opportunity for the love of God, and the power of the Holy Spirit to flow through you in the greeting ministry and begin to break things off of the lives of people so they can come in and they can connect much easier with God Almighty. Can I have a good amen? amen. See, that, that's one of the most thrilling things that I do every week. You say, but yeah, but, 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 but you, know, you know, maybe you should be preaching more or preaching some other meetings or something like that. You know, God opens doors when it's time to open doors and, you know, he shuts doors when it's time to shut doors and I'm not commenting either direction on anything that I said right there. But you know what? I'm just saying that I have learned that I can influence people no matter what I'm doing. I'll stand behind a pulpit and I'll influence people. I'll stand out there in the parking lot and greet people. I'll influence the exact same number of people. I'll go to the Cracker Barrel with my family. And I'll just walk up to people. You know, the time is short, so I'll just walk up to people and, and we just strike up a conversation and I'll say, by the way, have you ever surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior? I'll just take the direct route and let's just get down to business. Let's find out where you are and let me help you come into a absolute fantastic, enjoyable relationship with Jesus Christ. So it doesn't matter where I go, I'm going to influence people. Amen. See, Paul said the same thing. He said, now listen to me, this is in Philippians. He says, I know how to abound. You know, is he saying, I, I, I know how to accomplish the will of God when I got lots of money. But then he also said, I also know how to be abased. Well, that's an amazing thing because in the context of that scripture, he's saying, I also know how to fulfill the will of God for my life when I'm struggling and I don't have enough money. Well, that's interesting. Whether I got plenty of money, whether I don't have plenty of money, I'm still going to accomplish the same thing. He says, because I know how to do all things through Christ who strengtheneth me. Ooh. You see, that's where the power comes from. That's where the ability comes from. Am I helping anyone tonight? Yeah, okay. And you see, th this is how we need to learn to live and live in prayer, and live in worship. Did you know that the Hebrew and Greek, Greek words for prayer and worship, for the most part, 90% of the time, are the exact same word? It's true. You can't separate prayer and worship in the mind of the Hebrew, in the mind of God, in the covenant that he made with you and I. It's the exact same thing. Well, just like our government wants to separate the church away from the state by misrepresenting a letter that was written by Thomas Jefferson and saying that it's in the Constitution when it doesn't exist in the Constitution, we do the same thing today. We try to separate the prayer meeting away from our assembling together and away from our church services. It's true. Yeah, I've, I've sat in meetings with the Assemblies of God where they've actually taught, and I'm not picking on anyone, I'm not saying anything that's not public information, 
You know, if they put it out there publicly, I will talk about it publicly. If they talk about it privately, I won't mention it. But yeah, I've been in meetings where they've said, you know, we do not support praying in other tongues in a public Sunday morning service. If you want to pray in tongues, do it in a different service. In other words, we have to separate the Trinity, and we can only allow part of the Trinity to function on Sunday morning, but we'll allow the entire God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit to function in some other type of meeting. Man, is that stupid or what? That's not biblical. Come on now. Come on now, Maria. Yeah. Preach it. I, I speak in tongues. I pray in tongues. Amen. 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 And if that is the way that we're to do it. Praise God. Give the Lord a good hand clap. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So the Greek word for Christos means to carry the anointing of the Holy Spirit in our life. And many in these last days are going to say, I carry a mighty anointing from God. And because of that, you should listen to what I have to say. Well, you see, that can cause deception. These individuals that Jesus talked about rising themselves up in the last day and they'll cause believers to wander from the place of safety. That's why preachers need to talk about these things. Amen? Number three, everyone say number three. number three. Jesus taught us to discern false prophets by their fruit. Look at Matthew 7, 15 through 18. Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they're ravenous wolves. You'll know them. Now notice how we know them. He didn't say you'll know them by their gifts. But he says you'll know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears good fruit. But a bad tree bears bad fruit. A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor a bad tree bear good fruit. Now, listen to this, because this is just kind of a summation of what Jesus said. False prophets are not a part of a local church family, and they have no pastor. See, this is how we can discern whether or not someone's a real prophet or a false prophet. I was always taught from the foundation of ministry all the way back, Sheree, at Victory Christian Center with Pastor Billy Joe Doherty. And when we were in that internship minister's training class, we had just about everybody that was who's who come through there. I remember Daisy and T.L. Osborne coming through there and talking to us. Marilyn Hickey coming through there and talking to us. And uh, Catherine Coleman coming through there and talking to us. There was just a number of godly people with solid ministries that came through there and opened up their life, told us about their mistakes that they made, and told us about their victories that they received. And one of the things that we learned, and that is this, everyone needs a pastor. It's true. doesn't matter if you're an apostle, a prophet, an evangelist, another pastor, or a teacher. Everyone, whether they're a five-fold ministry gift or whether they're a believer, needs to be pastored. Amen? See, we've been apostolized in the body of Christ, prophetized in the body of Christ, teacherized in the body of Christ, evangelized in the body of Christ. I think we need to understand a little bit better how important it is to be pastorized. Am I helping anyone tonight? See, we can be so thankful we have such a wonderful pastor here who loves us, loves Jesus, loves God, loves the Word, feeds us with the Word of God. Amen? And watches over our souls as one 
that must give an account to God. So here's some other things how we discern what a false prophet is. Number one, when someone is not part of a local church, you don't know who in the world their pastor is because they probably don't have one. Uh, they hunger for signs, wonders, miracles, and revival more than they hunger for Jesus. See, Scripture never tells us be hungry for signs, wonders, miracles, revival. It says always to hunger and thirst for the Lord. Hunger and thirst for relationship with him. Because when we're in relationship with him, when we're abiding in the vine and he abides in us, the miracle working power of God just automatically flows, listen to me, out of relationship. Can someone say a good amen? amen? They primarily talk about themselves, their ministry, and their special anointing. They want to be served, but will never lift a finger to serve anyone else. And uh, here's the biggie right here. Their marriage and family, if they actually have one, is a mess. So true. So, so true. Scripture teaches very clearly that someone doesn't need to be trying to lead the house of God or have a public type of a ministry if they haven't first submitted their life to a local pastor to get washed up in the word of God, to get corrected. Everyone say corrected. See, didn't Paul tell Timothy? He, he says, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. Notice that two of those things that Paul told Timothy have to do with correction. Reprove, that's not comfortable. Rebuke, that ain't comfortable either. Exhort, I think I like that one a little better. <laughs> Come on now, because in Hebrews it says if God loves us, he's going to correct us. Yes, but correction at the present moment is never comfortable. Now, why does God correct us? Why does he purge us? And let me be clear on this because the scripture is clear. He does not use sickness and disease to do that. Sickness and disease and tribulation are not the agents of God that he uses to correct us and purge us. We're told he uses his word. We're told that he uses his spirit. And he uses his word skillfully coming out of the mouth of an apostle, a prophet, evangelist, pastor, or teacher. Amen? How many of y'all have ever listened to Joyce Meyer? I mean, you can't listen to Joyce Meyer much without realizing that probably 80 to 90% of what she talks about and teaches is let's all grow up in God, folks. Let's quit walking in the flesh. I spent all these years walking in the flesh myself. I remember when Joyce used to come and preach for us every year at Victory Christian Center in Des Moines before she got real famous. And uh, she'd come and she'd talk about the same stuff. I remember she preached on strife. Boy, did she preach and teach on strife. You can't get in that, folks. You'll just be walking in every evil work. You let strife in. You're letting the devil in. You're letting every evil work in. If the devil's coming after you and you got strife in your life, don't expect to come up to the altar and have an elder pray for you. That's not going to help you. You need to repent and get the strife out of your life. See, that's correcting. But without the correcting, we have no protecting. Can you hear what I'm saying tonight? We have no protection without the correction. Whew. I remember one time, this is when Cherie and I were in a traveling ministry, and we're so excited. We're traveling down the road. We're homeschooling our four little girls, and uh, we're on our way to a meeting and my mobile phone rings. And it's our pastor, Dr. Mark T. Barkley. What's going on, Kim? And uh, he's a former military man. He was a, uh, a Marine, a combat veteran Marine, two tours in Vietnam. 
And, uh, oh, I'm so glad that God gave me that Marine as a pastor to me and one of our fathers in the faith. He's probably, Sheree, I believe, the longest living uh, father in the faith and pastor to us that we have for 30 years now. We have sat under that man's ministry and supported his ministry. And uh, he says, well, Kim, he says, uh, I hear such and such happen between you and uh, this one pastor. Are you listening to what I'm sharing here? See, if we really have a pastor, if we're really submitted, that pastor has freedom to call our phone number, to talk to us about life and what we're doing, and bring correction and steer us back in the right direction. Amen? That's what's wrong with a lot of our young preachers today. They have no fathers in the faith. They just kick over all the ancient landmarks that have been set up by their fathers and say, well, this is a new generation. We're doing things a new way. Well, there's some things that are not new. There's never going to be a replacement for the blood of Jesus. Never going to be a replacement for the doctrine according to righteousness. That righteousness is a free gift by his blood. Never going to be a replacement for the doctrine of holiness. Am I helping anyone tonight? See, there, there's some things that might be a little bit new. You know, some people might dress a little different. And, uh, oh, I heard of this one uh, pastor, youth pastor. He put on these skinny jeans. They were so tight they had to take him to ER after the service and cut those tight jeans off him. <laughs> I can tell you something, you ain't never going to see me try to fit into a pair of skinny jeans. You say, well, 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 pastor, you know, how come sometimes you wear a pair of jeans and other time, you know, you're wearing a, a sport coat and nice pants. I just wear what I feel like wearing. It's that simple. If I feel like, oh, this is a nice comfortable day, a jean day, I'll wear a pair of jeans. If I feel like, oh, I just feel like dress up day. Well, then I'll dress up like I'm dressed up right now. What's the big deal? I was preaching for this one pastor, and he was all upset at one of the individuals that was on the platform on his worship team because he says, I don't know what's wrong with that guy. He's up there wearing a suit and a tie today. I told my team, I want everybody to be casual, everybody to be casual. And so I says, brother, you and I have been friends for years. What is the big deal? Let the guy dress how he wants to dress. Well, I just want our church to be a casual church. And I says, well, I hope you don't want them to be casual in their relationship with Jesus. Yeah, this is what I'm saying to him before I'm going out to preach. And I says, I guarantee you, and I'm not mentioning his name. I says, I guarantee you that I could go out in front of your church congregation and flow and carry the presence of God Almighty, whether I'm wearing a pair of jeans or whether I'm wearing a suit and tie or a tuxedo, it don't matter. He says, yeah, I, I believe that. And I says, well, then for heaven's sakes, quit being such a knucklehead and let the guy dress how he wants to dress. Come on now. Can someone have a good Amen. You know, that's so important because as this church begins to grow and move forward, we're going to have people come in here in all kinds of different dress that you could ever imagine in your life. And uh, we can't look at how somebody dresses, how many pieces of metal they have hanging out of their body, how many tattoos might be all over them. We can't look at that. We got to look at people as someone that Jesus shed his blood for and throw our arms of love around them no matter what. Can I have a good amen? amen. Praise the Lord. Number four, wars, famines, pestilence, shortages, earthquakes, and sorrows. Matthew 24, 6 through 9. Jesus said, And you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. Now look how he said we're to approach it. See that you are not troubled and worried and fretful. Just don't give it another thought. It's part of what's going to go on in the last of the last days. So when you see those things happening, just say, oh, it's just part of life. 
just part of life. And then pray for God's protection on people that are in that area and they're losing everything they have. Amen? And, and think of going on a medical missions team or something like that. There's plenty of opportunities for that to happen. It'll change your life. I've always told that to people. I says, you know what? You're so selfish and stingy, I know how to get you fixed. You, you need to go on a missions trip out of this country, a medical missions trip or something like that. You need to get over in a third world country and see how the rest of the world lives, Mr. Selfish Bucket. <laughs> it's true. And I've said that to people. And you know what? I've seen people go out of the country and, uh, man, some of the most hard-to-get-along people you can imagine, and they'll come back, Pastor, 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 you couldn't believe how poor they are over there. I gave away everything I had. Well, not everything. You came home with clothes on, not naked as a jaybird, but uh, you know what I'm saying, amen? And uh, so you'll hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you are not troubled for all these things must come to pass, but the end is not yet. So he's answering his disciples' questions. He's letting them know, we're going to have such and such happen, this will take place, but the end of this age is not yet. See, sometimes we can look at what's going on right now and we're thinking, oh, Jesus, he could come any moment, any time. And that's true. But we also have to realize that no man knows the day or the hour, and we better make sure that we put our Holy Ghost foot down and that we take a stand for righteousness. We don't need, we don't need these transgenders and trans-communists and trans-socialists and trans-Marxists telling you and I as parents and grandparents that we no longer have a right to train our children up in biblical conservative values. Can I have a good amen? amen. Absolutely not. As men of God, as women of God, it's time that we storm our public school meetings and school board meetings, and it's time that if some of us get the unction that we decide, I'm going to run for school board and bring traditional Christian values back to our public schools in the name of Jesus, but it's not going to happen if you and I just talk about it, complain about it, and sit on our duff and we don't do something about it, amen? Amen. It's time that you and I take a godly, righteous stand. Oh, yeah, it may even be time for us to follow in the footsteps of Martin Luther King Jr. and do peaceful protests, peaceful mass protests where we literally walk through cities, camp on the steps of City Hall, and we pray and we worship our God, and if they carry us off and put us in a jail, so be it. I'm ready to go. What about you? Because I don't want my kids to live in this mess. I don't want my kids to live in some transgender, trans-communist, trans-Marxist, trans-socialist society. Amen? Oh, no. This is what they've planned for many, 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 many years. Many years. And it's time that we say, you're not going after my kids. You're not having my kids no more. Amen? Hallelujah. For nation will rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there will be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in various places. All these things are the beginning of sorrows. Now, the word sorrows is a very interesting word because the Greek word for sorrow is Odin, and it means the pain and travail of childbirth, and this may be referring to a worldwide hunger for Christ's kingdom to come. It's the beginning of sorrows when people look out at this happening, and the body of Christ looks at it, 
and they finally just cannot go through the motions anymore where we're just those come, sit, listen, and go people. I come, I sit, I listen to a message and go. But finally, we get some fire in our belly and the word in our heart, and we begin to intercede and cry out for God, come, Lord Jesus. And he blows his breath of life across the world. And many come into the kingdom of God through mass revival worldwide that politicians can do absolutely nothing about. It's true. A politician in an army can use their weapons and they can stop another army. But what are they going to do when you got moms and dads and grandpas and teenagers storming the streets, full of the power of God, healing the sick, raising the dead, weeping on their knees? Are you listening? Oh, don't think it couldn't happen. It can happen. It can happen here. I'm telling you, Sheree and I were a part of a 40 straight week revival. I never forget Michael French, one of the great Assembly of God evangelists. He, he was 69 or 70 at that time. I remember Cherie. And uh, he was preaching a message called Lost. And, and so I, I knew what he's talking about. I, I knew what he's going to give an altar call for. But the presence and the cloud was so thick, people just did not want to leave our services. And uh, I'm sitting there on the front row just weeping and bawling my eyes out. And uh, I'm just rationalizing. I'm so hungry for God. I know he's going to give an altar call for first-time salvation, but I'm so hungry for God. I've got to get to the altar. And then I thought, well, wait a minute. Salvation is the Greek word sozo and soterian, and it means to be completely made whole, to be healed, etc. Oh, but Lord, my whole church family, they're going to think they've got a heathen for a pastor and that he's going to the altar to get saved. And uh, I finally reasoned within myself, and I said, I don't care what anyone thinks. Amen. They can think what they want to think. Amen. You see, those very thoughts are the thoughts that keep you and I from going to the altar because in our mind we've been taught the altar is the place for wicked people to repent. It's not true. The altar is the place where righteous men and women of God meet with God and get fuller and fuller and fuller of his will, of his purpose, of his presence. Can I have a good amen? So when Michael French gave that call to the altar... I didn't have far to go, probably, you know, from this chair up to the altar. But I'm telling you, I catapulted to the altar. I laid on my belly. I wept and wept and wept and wept. And I'm telling you, something supernatural happened at that point in my life where bondages were broken off of me that I didn't even know existed. We went out to the Cracker Barrel that day, my wife and I and a bunch of other folks, and uh, they called our name, and uh, as I'm getting ready to go in with everybody else, oh, I saw this one beautiful African-American family. The little girls had all those little bows in there, you know, how you do those pigtails or whatever. They were just so cute. And I stopped and I started to weep, and I just said to them, have you all, you have such a beautiful family. Have you all surrendered your life to Jesus as your Lord and Savior? Well, some of them had and some of them haven't. I prayed for those that, that hadn't yet. And then I'm trying to get to my seat and uh, I see another family at one table. So I stop and share my testimony with them. And uh, I make it to another table. And uh, Cherie, I think you all ordered before I ever made it to the table like 30 minutes later. And I was wondering, is the manager going to stop me from doing this? And they never did. They never did. I don't know. Maybe the glory was all over me. But uh, I've been that same way ever since. You'll find out you ever go anywhere with me in public. I've had people say, you're embarrassing, Pastor. You're just embarrassing. Well, what's embarrassing about asking somebody straight out? Have you surrendered your life to Jesus yet? Because statistics show that if a believer is standing in front of someone that maybe has never heard the real gospel message, if you as a believer don't share it with them, then they may never hear it 
from anyone else. It's so true. And I mean, I'm just overwhelmed with that everywhere I go. It's amazing I ever make it anywhere on time because I remember I was driving past a park one time, saw a family there. I was supposed to preach somewhere. Yeah, I was. In, in Illinois, I was supposed to preach. And, and the Lord says, stop your car and go back and talk to them. And I says, well, I'm going to be late for the meeting. He says, what's more important, souls in my kingdom or you being at this meeting on time? So I stopped. I went back. I talked to them. They were right in the middle of an argument. How many of you know life is life for everybody? They needed money. They needed finances. They didn't know where it was going to come from. And so I talked with them, asked them if they ever had heard the gospel. I shared the gospel with them, prayed with both of them to receive Christ. I never, never forget the, the young husband, the father. He says, I just don't know what we're going to do for grocery money. Whew. I opened my billfold, and there's a couple hundred dollar bills I didn't even know was in there. And, uh, you know, when God blesses you with something, you have to know what it's for. Amen? And I knew those two, two $100 bills were for them. And I handed it to them. And they says, oh, we can't take this. And I says, you going to fight me over it? Or what's the deal here? <laughs> I says, no. I says, salvation's a free gift. This is a free gift from me. And so then I went on to the meeting to preach the meeting. This is how I live my life. This is how I stay full of joy. I, I, I do my best to try to focus on God. I, I do my best to try to focus on other people and help people. Amen? Well, I could tell you story after story after story. God is so, 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 so good. So, so, so good. He went on to say, these are the beginning of sorrows, which means the pain of travail, possibly intercession for the soon coming king to return. Then they'll deliver you up to be afflicted and kill you, and you'll be hated of all nations for my name's sake. And I'm going to have to kind of move through this quickly and finish off. Number five, offenses, betrayal in the home, hatred, and deception. Matthew 24, 10, and 11. And then many will be offended, which is the Greek word skandalizo, which means to commit apostasy and walk away from God, but not even know that you walked away from God. Oh, there's many church people like that today. It's true. Our churches in America need to be evangelized all over again. Yeah, that's it. they do. And uh, many will be offended, will betray one another, and will hate one another. The, the Greek word here for hate is misio, which means to love one another less or to just kind of detest someone or to become lukewarm. See, if we get to the point, well, I don't really like them, I don't really love them, I'm just putting up with them, I just, I just don't know if I really want to be around this person, it's detesting them. Something's going in the wrong direction in our life when that happens. And so many will become offended, betray one another, and hate one another. Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. I often wondered, and I would ask this question, God, why, why will many false prophets rise up and deceive many? Here's the reason why. Because when you and I get an offense in our heart, anger in our heart, unforgiveness in our heart, or our love is just kind of leaking and oozing out of us and we don't really love someone or like someone, we just kind of put up with them and detest someone. You see, you and I cannot hold on to an offense and hold on to God at the same time. It's not possible. It's either one or the other. And if we're holding on to an offense and we become offended at someone, hold a grudge, Refuse to forgive. And Dave, if I can have you head back to the keyboard. Or just detest other people and become lukewarm. It's not a matter of if we will become deceived. But is a matter of when we will become deceived. Did you hear that? 
because we can't hold on to an offense, a grudge, anger, or unforgiveness at the same time. And if we choose to keep holding on to an offense, it's not a matter of if we'll be deceived, but when. Are you listening? Let me read these last things here, if you can stand to your feet. And I'm going to close after I read this. Number seven, I had to skip number six. How to persevere and not be deceived. Number one, you ready for this? Be an integral part of a solid, spirit-filled, Holy Ghost, word-preaching, praying in tongues, family-oriented, devil-casting-out, filled with God's presence, soul-winning, hungry-for-Jesus, revivalist, local church. Can I have a good amen? We're part of one. It's called Life Church. Amen? Number two, how to persevere and not be deceived. Participate in every church service, special service, and prayer meeting. Number three, get planted in your local church, embrace the vision, mission, and purpose, and serve as a faithful team member. Number four, you ready for number four? Study your Bible and develop your relationship with Jesus. So, some people never go on and develop a relationship with Jesus. They're always living off the prayers of other people. Man, I, I've had to tell people at times when they just come in and want in prayer week after week after week, I'll have to say, brother or sister, don't be like the foolish virgin. Be like the wise virgin. You've got to have your own oil. Don't, don't try to live off of my oil and my prayer relationship. Develop your own. Can I have a good amen? Say, I must develop my own relationship with Jesus. Well, that's, that's good sound teaching right there. Number four, study your Bible and develop your relationship with Jesus. I read that twice. Number five. Come to the altar during praise, worship, and corporate prayer. See, that, that's what I had to train myself to do. The altars are not for the wicked. The altars are for the righteous. I, I'm not going to the altar that I necessarily need to repent. I'm going to the altar to recommit myself to God, to enjoy His presence, to get full of His presence, and to let His Holy Spirit fill me up to the fullest more and more and more and more. Can I have a good amen? Number six, embrace correction as your best friend. I learned to do that young in my life. Number seven, when you get offended... Wipe your snotty nose and walk in forgiveness. Can we say a good amen? Number eight, stop following self-proclaimed social media prophets who have no local church family, no real pastor, don't know you, and don't even care to know you. Because they're only after how many likes they get how many are following them, and how much fame they have. And number nine, live this way consistently and don't ever quit. Say, I'm never going to quit. Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you we could get together and surrender our hearts to you, worship you, surrender to you get filled up with your Holy Spirit and presence and your good word. And Lord, this day is going to be over soon. Let all of us wake up tomorrow morning with a new and fresh day and recommit our life to you again tomorrow and make a practice of doing this every day of our life in Jesus' name. And everyone said, Amen.